Welcome to Freedom Lovin'. This is Kevin, and this is episode number 201. And in just a minute, I have an interview coming up with Mikkel Thorup of expatmoney.com with the Expat Money Show. And uh, it's a really interesting chat, so stay tuned for that. I uh, just had a couple of things to mention before then. First of all, I, uh, w- I wanted to read off uh, an Amazon review for The Rebel's Guide to Freedom, um, which is available on Amazon, The Rebel's Guide to Freedom, if you want to check that out. And uh, this one uh, was particularly interesting to me. It's uh, from the the name is S, just S. So obviously you wanted to be private. Uh, it says the title is finally a sane voice of reason in a world gone mad. At last, someone gets it. Life doesn't have to be about all the crap that those success gurus are throwing around. Your life can be so much simpler, uh, so much simpler than that. It can be about attaining freedom. I love the subtitle of this book because it conveys the message far more clearly than the title. Quote, becoming resilient, owning your life and thriving. That right there is the whole enchilada as far as I'm concerned. You're going to need to become much more resilient uh, with what's coming our way. You are only ever going to find real happiness when you step outside of the conventional path and choose your own life. And the ultimate end shouldn't be to do whatever is it is your debt-ridden manic manic base frantic neighbors are doing your ultimate ambition should be to create an amazing and enjoyable life in which to thrive if i had any complaint at all it would be that i wish the book were twice as long particularly towards the final third of the book kevin Costello could have uh, doubled or even tripled the material elaborating on his culminating ideas and i'd have remained wrapped he is just so dead on right about so many things that most everyone else is completely befuddled about in today's increasingly kooky world. A welcome and important message we should all be thinking about much more than we are. Definitely a clear call to action. It's time to rethink what you're doing in your life, where you're putting your time, effort, and money, and how you are choosing to spend the fleeting time that you have available to create something meaningful, authentic, and attuned to the way that you would most love spending your days. This book will help you do that. So uh, thanks so much, S. But uh, I thought it was a, a good review of uh, The Rebel's Guide to Freedom, um, which you can pick up at uh, Amazon.com. Um, I don't have the copy with me because I didn't have enough room in my backpack to bring it down here, to bring uh, multiple copies here to Brazil. But I wanted to recommend, uh, before I get to the interview, I wanted to recommend this book. It's called 4,000 Weeks. And the subtitle is Time Management for Mortals. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can see me holding the book up. Um, it's been a really interesting read for me. It's, it talks about time and um, how we generally, most people don't have an idea of how to use your time um, in the best way. It's mostly done with trying to take shortcuts and hacks and time management systems and none of this stuff works. And we ended up feeling like time is just flying by and nothing ever gets done. And we're focused on all the wrong things. And he gets into social media, he gets into like, uh, you know, purpose and things like that. So it's it's a really interesting book and I recommend it. Um, I'm going to have, I'll probably do a, a freedom read on it at some point, but um, for now I would just go out and buy the book. I got the audio and then I got the written, the um, hard copy after that. And I've been highlighting it and I'm just loving going through it. So um, yeah, that's about it. Um, just uh, men- just want to quickly mention that um, I'm here in Brazil and uh, traveling down here is not a problem. Uh, there's no more paperwork involved except for a passport. But um, as far as like they, they give you the option of a negative COVID test or a uh, vaccine uh, card. And, um, but they do that, they, they check it all at the airline. So I think that's probably going to go away soon as well. So it's getting, you know, it's definitely getting much less COVID, COVID-ish uh, here. So that's really exciting. So, okay. So I'm going to get on to the interview. Um, I'm going to read the introduction here on this little intro uh, video, and then we'll go into the uh, conversation. Mikkel is the founder and CEO at Expat Money, a private consulting firm started in 2017. He hosts the popular weekly podcast, The Expat Money Show, and wrote the definitive number one best-selling book, Expat's, Expat Secrets, How to Pay Zero Taxes, Live Overseas, and Make Giant Piles of Money. A world traveler since his teens, Mikkel Thorpe has learned his craft in three unique and unconventional ways. First, by living it himself, continuously pushing the boundaries, testing new ideas around the globe. Next, from diligent and intense study, consuming over 2,000 books and courses on the subject. And finally, by apprenticing and learning directly from the world's top legal experts in the field. Mikkel has uh, dedicated himself for over two decades to building this mountain of knowledge, 
one that is not constrained by languages, cultures, or borders. He now works one-on-one -on -one with private clients utilizing this combination of hard-won experience and in-depth knowledge and has helped uh, hundreds of people to build their dream lives abroad. And his website is expatmoney.com. All right, Mikel, welcome to Freedom Loving. Happy to be back. It's uh, it's good to talk to you, my friend. You know, it's been a little while since we've caught up, so I'm looking forward to today's conversation. Yeah, it's funny. I was actually like kind of preparing for this show, and I was like, I thought you were on the podcast before. It, it just seems like you should have been on the podcast a long time ago. Um, but it, it was uh, true that I was on your podcast, and I might have just been getting mixed up there because I couldn't find an episode that I did with Freedom Loving. So. I'm sure I've been on your podcast before. Definitely you've been on mine hundred yeah. percent, but yeah. I'm sure I've been on your show as well. So I'm pretty sure okay. this is our second. <laughs> oh, is I, it? Okay. After having dinners together and yeah. emails back and forth and phone calls and lots of stuff, my friend, I, I get confused too. So yeah, yeah, that may maybe maybe that's it. But um, but anyway, you know, it's it's great to talk to you and and uh like I'm I'm glad we got to connect now because the last time we talked was it was June of 2021. I mean, last time we did a, a show together. And, um, you know, it's funny because it, it, I was, I think at that time we were, we were talking about COVID and, you know, what's going on and all the craziness. And, and now it's like a year and almost a year and a half later and everything is still totally crazy, but we're kind of out of that whole COVID uh, era, it seems like. It's and, all uh, new crazy stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Just, it just it continues to be, uh, you know, crazy is the, is the word and, and, and clown world continues. But um, yeah. So I, I guess before we like, get into the the current stuff and the and the current world um events and things like that uh like can you start with your background and like i mean you've had you have a really interesting um background in terms of how you grew up and then how you ended up living in like eight countries or nine or something like that and um i i want to i want to get that story out there even if we've you know we've kind of covered it before sure i'm happy to go through it and i'll try to whiz through it a little bit but um Basically what happened, um, so, so I'm from Southwestern Ontario, I'm a Canadian citizen. Uh, when I was a child, I was diagnosed with a learning disability. And what they did, Kevin, was they pulled me out of school and they sat me down in a little room. And I think it was the principal and the vice principal and like a resource teacher or something like that. And they sat me down and they said, Mikkel, something doesn't work quite right in your brain. And what we want to do is send you to a special school, special school for special boys. So that's what they did. Every day for three years, I got on a little white bus, took a little white bus across town, and I went to, uh, to this quote unquote special school. Now, the only problem, Kevin, was it was not a special school. It was actually a regular school with a special class. So you can probably imagine what happened. I got in a ton of fights. I got picked on. I got bullied. And it was all around a pretty horrible experience. Now, this is no woe is me, woe is me, poor Mikkel, I'm a victim type of story. Certainly not. Like, I mean, I got hit and I hit back. And if possible, I would hit twice as hard. Like, I would never claim otherwise. I hate victim mentality at, at all levels. But um, basically, after three years of having a really crummy experience, I got to go back to my neighborhood school. And I thought, this is going to be so amazing. All my friends will have missed me. Everyone's going to be so excited to see me. And, you know, day one and back in my neighborhood school, and you can imagine what happened again. Everybody starts gossiping and whispering. Oh, I remember Mikkel. He went to some retard school. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Totally politically correct. Kids are very sensitive. You know oh, yeah. how they are. But uh, it just left such a bad taste in my mouth for public education. And, um, and I started not going anymore. And then when I stopped going, then I started failing. And then they'd put me in summer school and then I'd fail that. And somehow they'd push me along. And um, long story short, I stopped, stopped going to school when I was 12 years old. And I officially dropped out when I was 15. And I started traveling internationally, not shortly after that. And when I started traveling, Kevin, I found, I felt like I had found like my peeps, like these are my people. i met all these amazing people who were building their, their lives in new countries. They, no one knew their backstory or their history mm -hmm. or anything like that. No one knew that I had this learning disability, which is side note, it's dyslexia. Like it's not a big deal whatsoever. Actually, we kind of know now it's right. kind of common and lots of people have it and it's, it's not really a big deal. Certainly not enough to, to pull the kid out of school and put him in a special program and you know, all of that. But uh, fast forward, uh, I've been traveling now going on 23 years straight. Uh, I've circumnavigated the globe over 400 times. I've visited, I think I'm up to 110 countries. 
Uh, I've lived in nine different countries now, and um, and it's my whole life. I mean, it's my life from the hobby side, as in I love to travel and explore the world and search for freedom. Uh, from the personal side, uh, I have a very international family. I got two kids. You know, last time we were hanging out together, you got to meet my son in Brazil mm-hmm. together. And, you know, we did birth tourism down there. Um, my wife's from China. And then from the business side, I mean, I help people move overseas and we deal with all their immigration issues and their tax issues and the structuring of the businesses and all of these types of things. And I figured out how to do all of this on my own, like basically being a guinea pig and going through it, working with mentors, working with people who have done these types of things, and then just a ridiculous amount of studying. So yeah, doing very well. I I enjoy it very much and kind of happy to take the conversation in whichever direction you like, Kevin. Yeah. The direction I, yeah, the direction I want to go is birth tourism. I mean, that's, that's just fascinating because I'm here in uh, Brazil and that's where you had your son and uh, you've done this and it's um, yeah, it's very interesting. So why did you, uh, okay, first of all, let's talk about what, what is birth tourism and why did you pick Brazil? Okay. So birth tourism is going to a country with the, the intention of giving birth there and the desire to use that child as a way to get them another citizenship. And if possible, uh, the parents or the grandparents or family members, additional immigration as well. So a lot of people will do it with the United States or with Canada. That's kind of very traditional. People come from much poorer countries and they want to enter North America and they want to give their children what they think is the best opportunity. Uh, I am also, I also want to give my children the best opportunity. I just differ in what that means and, and how we go about it. So for birth tourism for Brazil, we flew down when my wife was six months pregnant. Uh, we entered the country legally under a tourist visa and, uh, and we stayed under a tourist visa and gave birth in the country, which gives us well, first of all, the, the child is automatically a Brazilian citizen, like right from day one. So that's an additional passport. And Brazilian passport is a fantastic passport. But on top of that, Brazil is really attractive because they have a program called the Family Reunification Visa. So if you are the legal guardian of a Brazilian citizen, you can actually apply for your permanent residency. And after a short track, uh, fast track of having this permanent residency, you can actually get your own citizenship. So I think technically the law says one year, but I don't know anybody who's done it in one year. I always like to say it's two years to go through the program uh, to get your Brazilian citizenship. Yeah, you're so, dealing with the bumbling Brazilian bureaucracy, so it's probably easily two years. Exactly. So double it and expect it's going to take three times as much money. But right. um, yes, Brazil is probably the most bureaucratic country I've ever worked in. Mm-hmm. This is not for the faint of heart by any stretch of the imagination. But um, it was a good experience. We love Brazil. And, you know, we were in Florianopolis, which is where you are. And it's just a little piece of heaven on planet Earth. Like, I mean, there's nowhere more beautiful than Floripa. After visiting so many places, it's just, it's the best. Like, I, I'm just such a fan of it there. Yeah. And how far along is so you guys are um, getting pretty close to getting your, your residency or citizenship? Uh, well, that's a different story because we would have to actually live there for the the one to two years to get our citizenship. Yeah. And we're not living there right now. But um, I actually just had a call half an hour ago with a private client of mine. I work mostly one on one with clients and we were working through Brazilian um, birth tourism. And he had a really good word for it. It's he, he basically called it a call option. And I think that's a, a great terminology because it is, it's a call option on immigration that you don't need to pull the trigger now, but from basically the moment the child is born until they turn 18 years old, you have that call option option to go through the residency program and get your permanent residency and then eventually citizenship. Oh, interesting. Yeah. That's, uh, that's very cool. Yeah. Just in case the uh, things, things kind of fall apart where you are, you can just head, down, head on down to Brazil, right? Exactly. And so you're it's another one of those plan B type of backup plans. Um, you know, we have quite a few, our family, yeah. I like to test a lot of these things out and I work with my clients on a lot of them, but, uh, it's another good one to have. And my child already has his passport and I think he's actually on his second one now because he's 18 months old now. So, right. Right. And you're in Panama city right now, right? 
Correct. Yeah, we live a, the majority of the year in Panama City, but obviously we travel like tons and we've got other homes around the world and stuff. But I like Panama City. I think it's a really nice place and it's tax free and nice warm weather. I don't want to be snub- shoveling snow back in Canada by any means. <laughs> yeah. Or, or or have your bank account seized by the the, the bureaucrats. <laughs> yeah, or be on my 67th booster. So right. <laughs> yeah. That's- yeah, it's getting, getting getting kind of scary up there in uh in in, in a good old Scandinavia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh so uh, you know, you you've had one thing I wanted to kind of talk about is you know, I'm, this is the Freedom Eleven podcast, and freedom has been a huge part of your life um since you were a kid. And I, I, how did you how, how did you think would you say that you got sort of you were attracted to freedom and being able to live in different places and you know, sort of having both personal freedom, like financial freedom, political freedom, all that stuff. So from the travel side, um, the way that it came about was my father had backpacked when he was in his 20s. And growing up, I listened to him a thousand and one times tell me that travel was the greatest thing he ever did with his life. Now, I kind of scratched my head a little bit because I couldn't understand why if it was the best thing he ever did with his life, he only did, you know, one big trip, you know, that was kind of it. So when I started traveling as a teenager, I realized he was right. Like, first of all, travel is the greatest thing you can do with your life. And it is a vehicle for freedom. Um, so decided to dedicate my life to that. Now, I, I'm a pretty outspoken libertarian. Um, you know, if you guys have heard me on, you know, pretty much every libertarian podcast in the world, I think I've made an appearance at least one time, maybe four or five times. But I think that a lot of that driver for freedom really came with my personal experiences through public education, which I kind of just shared a little bit of that with you at the beginning of, of our talk today. But, you know, going through that situation and just seeing how wrong it was and, it was just coercion and violence. You know, that's really how I look at public education. Um, it just drove me to libertarianism as a, as a natural course. Now, I, I would like to think, or I would like to say that I was a libertarian before I even knew what the word libertarian was, before I even heard the word, I was a libertarian. So I consider myself kind of lifelong with these types of goals of personal responsibility and freedom and peace and prosperity and obviously the non-aggression principle. Yeah. But uh, I guess those are some of the big drivers in my life that have really helped shape things. Yeah. So uh, and just speaking of um, politics, uh, what do you think like right now, we're just in such a mess in, in the world generally. Um, I know you're really big on carving out your own freedom, like not sort of like going with, uh, you know, the news stories and getting all wrapped up in that kind of thing. But but just you know, kind of looking at the bigger picture, are you more of an optimist or do you think it's, it's going to be pretty rough here in the next few years? I would say both. Like, I'm certainly not a political analyst by any means. I'm very much an optimistic kind of person. And, and I, I follow geopolitics because I want to understand what's happening in the world. But I don't let it control my life by right. any means. I know that there is true evil in the world. Um, I've seen it. We've all seen it in the last two and a half years, three years now. And I am really focused on solutions. I'm a really action orientated type of person. I like to do things. I want to keep moving the ball downfield. So I don't sit around on my podcast, on the expat money show, or in my newsletter. I don't sit around complaining about things all day. You know, there's enough people to do that. I'm just trying to find, hey, what's the best solution? How does this work? How does it how does it fit together? What laws can we use? How can we build a stronger community? How can we be more wealthy and protect our wealth? You know, what does that all look like? How do the pieces fit together? That's my really, really, really small niche in all of this. But yeah, there's no question about it. The last three and a half, or two and a half, three years has been unbelievable. Like I just, if you went back four years ago and tried to explain to someone what is happening today, they would think you were absolutely nuts. <laughs> like they just, there was no way they would believe you. Yeah. Yeah. But on the bright side, uh, you know, we're kind of pulling out of it a little bit. I mean, it's, it's, it's a really strange thing. Cause I just traveled, you know, this is uh, Tuesday this week. I traveled here, down here to Brazil and, you know, like landing when we, the flight landed, they made an announcement. They said, Brazil does not require any paperwork to enter and it's like the last time I was here, it was like, you know, back test, a vaccine card, you know, the whole deal. 
and um, you know, just a passport now. So some things are getting rolled back and that's kind of interesting to see. But now it's best going back to business as usual. So now it's war in Europe and dropping bombs on women and children. And now we're seeing soaring energy prices yeah. and burning down food processing plants and all kinds of weird stuff. So I, honestly, I feel like we're at, under attack on multiple fronts. Yeah. And it's not just one thing, like they're not going to give up. I mean, it right. is an absolute power grab. And I, that, that is my opinion about what's going on. Yeah. And so, you, you know, you talked about like your more solution focus. What do you think is the best thing to do right now to, to kind of preserve the freedom that we have, like it, both individually, mostly individually, but, but it, any other ways that, um, you know, kind of how, how can things change for the better? Sure. So I'm really a pragmatic person. I, I like to think of myself very much as a realist. So I don't ever assume that I, I know all the answers or I know what's best. I'm always trying to ask myself like, well, what if I got it wrong? What if this doesn't make sense? What if this doesn't work? So I'm, I'm a plan B, plan C, plan D, plan, you know, over and over and over again. So for example, I live in Panama City, Panama, like we talked about, and we had lockdowns here. Well, when that happened, my wife and I looked around and went, well, where else can we give birth? You know, we were at the doctors the one time and they're telling us, uh, in the birthing room, you, your wife will need to wear a mask while she's in labor. And I'm like, no, <laughs> not <laughs> happening. This is not happening. Yeah. So, you know, we look around, Hey, what's, where's the freest places in the world? Oh, Brazil. Perfect. Go on down there for that. And, you know, we were not doing any masking the entire time we were there. Yeah. Uh, restaurants and bars were open. I, I know some people were masking, but I wasn't, you know, yeah. so I didn't have to deal with that. You know, we've got homes in other countries, you know, if things got bad here in Panama or in one of those ones, we'd move to the next one. I think it's all about being really nimble in this day and age. Mm -hmm. You can't put all your eggs in one basket. You can't assume that you know what's going to happen or this is going to work out the best. You need to be diversified. And, and that's how I look at it. Yeah, because this is a worldwide thing. I mean, we saw with COVID that it's not just like, one country doing something, oh, I'll just go, I'll just go run down to, you know, Central America and everything will be great. Cause you just never know what's, what's the next thing that might happen. I mean, I think Brazil is pretty safe because, you know, it's always been kind of a shit show here in terms of like politics and bureaucracy and all that. Um, and they don't really piss anybody off. Like they're not pissing off the Russians or anything. They don't really care. They just trade. And, and, and even though it's a total mess here, it's like, you know, they're, they're, they're the odds of nuclear war are pretty, pretty much zero here. And, and that's kind of a nice thing, but things can change. And uh, I wouldn't want to be stuck somewhere. That's a, uh, sure. that's, that's a thing. Well, look at Scandinavia. So Scandinavia came out as, you know, specifically Sweden as one of the more free places during COVID, but now with war in Europe and soaring energy prices, you'd be freezing your balls off there this winter, you know, <laughs> like, right. uh, so yes, they did great on one front, but you know, a thousand percent increase on energy prices. Like, how are you going to live with that? Yeah. So you, you can't just expect that it's all going to be the same. I mean, we're yeah. under attack on multiple fronts. It's not just hitting you with the same thing over and over again. Right. Right. So what's the answer? So get a, get a second citizenship, right? I'm, I'm a big fan of second passports, second residencies, having a second home, um, you know, yeah. if possible, you know, you rent it out on short-term rentals, have a storage locker downstairs, have your things there, especially if you live in different climates than having, you know, if it's a cold weather place, having warm, just keeping your warm weather clothing there, um, you know, having a desk there that I can do proper work, uh, these types of things, um, obviously offshore bank accounts, how I structure my finances, trusts, foundations. I work with a lot of my clients on asset protection. So getting assets out of their own names using nominee services. So basically a, a local law firm who will be the director and the treasurer and the president, all of these types of things. So your name doesn't appear on any of the documents. Basically you're the beneficial owner. So you get to use the house or use the boat or use the helicopter or the car or whatever it is, Yeah. but your name's not on any of it. You know, nice. that's, that's the, that's where we want to be. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I've talked in the past on this podcast about like New Mexico LLCs being anonymous and uh, how all the benefits of that. And yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly where you want to be. It's like, um, you don't want to be a target, right? Exactly. Uh, I mean, I'm a pretty public figure. I'm, 
as I said, pretty outspoken a lot about a lot of these types of things. So then it's kind of difficult, you know, going through a privacy side, which I very much believe in, but at the same time, being able to build a business and be a public figure about it. So it's kind of this, this push and pull, like I want to share what I do with my traveling and I want to share where we go and the experiences. And I write a newsletter at expatmoney.com. But at the same time, I, have a wife and I have kids and I've got private things that go on with my family. And so it's this kind of, you know, what do you share and what you don't share is always a bit challenging. Yeah, that, that's right. It is. And, and, and like, I, I, I still ha- have an Instagram account and it's, it's like, I know that they're collecting data and, you know, it's like any, you know, just look at my Instagram. Oh, there he's in Brazil now. And, you know, like all that, but um, you know, it's just like, I, I don't know. I feel like there's, all, there's, if, if somebody wants to find me or, target me or something, they're going to do it anyway. It doesn't matter. You know, some of this stuff doesn't really matter. I mean, I use signal, uh, the signal app, but you know, who knows, like it's, it it might not be the the sure proof thing Mm -hmm. for privacy. Well, I agree with that completely. And I recently got my handgun license here in Panama with a concealed carry license and, uh, and a couple of other gun license. So I'm, armed as well, because as things go on, you just never know as well. So Panama is a super safe place. Like I, I feel very safe here, Yeah. but at the same time, I also be, believe in personal responsibility. So it's nice as an expat to be able to have a firearm and legally carry it. And, uh, and it's, it's fun to go to the range with my friends as well. So nice. Nice. That's, that's good. So Panama is not too, are there, are there, they're, they're somewhat gun friendly. Yeah, I would say it's quite a gun-friendly country. Yeah. Um, I mean, they have you have to go through the KYC and mm-hmm. know your customer due diligence type of things. But um, yeah, we're successfully getting clients of ours. We're working through all these processes for firearm license here. Nice. That's awesome. What are some other countries that you think are would be a good place to go like right now in 2022? So I just got back from Argentina and Uruguay about a week or two, maybe two weeks ago. Uh, this is my second trip down to Uruguay. I really like it there. I mean, if shit really hits the fan, mm-hmm. Uruguay is a great place to be. They're food independent. They're water independent. It's amazing climate there. It's lots of English speaking. Um, there's just not too much that goes on. It's a little bit boring, but, yeah. you know, Maybe that's a good thing in this instance. Um, so I really like Uruguay. I took a group of, uh, I don't know, about 15 private clients, just under 15 private clients down there uh, to look at the real estate and the agricultural land and the immigration. They have a fantastic tax system down there for foreigners coming down. They basically have a 10 plus one tax holiday, uh, 10 plus one years uh, tax holiday. So that's pretty attractive. What is that? 10, 10 plus something? So basically you don't pay any taxes on your foreign sourced income for 10 years plus the year that you enter. So wow. yeah. Yeah. That's not bad. Yeah. And for more or less a first world country, like yeah. I would consider Uruguay a first world country. Right. They have all the infrastructure. They have everything that you would want there. Um, it's a very good option. Now we went to Argentina. We went to Buenos Aires after that. And although a very beautiful city and a lot of possibilities the country's just a basket case when you start <laughs> learning about the laws and the corruption and the inflation and the banking and the bureaucracy like if you think brazil is bad yeah like this is like on steroids yeah i was i was shocked when i went through this oh yeah they, they, i have a developer on my team that uh, lives in, in Buenos Aires. he's an argentinian and uh he talks about some of the things that they go through and it is just insane and they look up to brazil as like having it together, like that's how bad it is. It's like it goes oh like uh, I guess Venezuela would be the lowest, and then Argentina is yeah. a little bit better, and then Brazil. So yeah, yeah, it's it's nuts. Well, and I went to Peru. I took my wife for her birthday a few months ago to Peru, and same story. What a basket case of a country! Yeah. I couldn't believe it, and the the mentality of the people there was so socialist, like every word that came out of their mouth was just pro-socialism. Like yeah. that person has a business, uh, like they're evil. Like wow. that was like the whole like mentality. Like yeah. everything should be free. Everything should be provided. And anybody who wants to have their own business was like deemed evil. And it wasn't wow. like one time I picked it up in conversation. Right. It was like 
50 times. Every time we were talking to a local or a, um, a driver or an Uber or, a, you know, my Spanish is pretty decent, so I can chit chat with people. Yeah. And just some of the stuff that came out, like, wow, you, like, do you have any idea, you know, what's going on in the world? Or yeah. have you read any history books or? Yeah. Man, it's just it's, very it's, bizarre. It's so sad to see. It seems like, like most of Latin America is just coming back around to where they were before, back to socialism. Yeah. Let's try it again. Exactly. Maybe it'll work this time. Like, exactly. And I mean, that's one of the nice things about Uruguay. It's a right-leaning government. Uh -huh. uh, but even when the government was centered left, it was still a pretty decent place to live. They were yeah. still very pro-business. It wasn't this insanity woke culture. It wasn't this hardcore socialism. It just you know, it was more neutral and, you know, freedom, freedom loving type of country. Yeah. So I, I've been very impressed there on both my visits now. Wow. Yeah. It wasn't on my radar. That's an interesting uh, place. I'm going to head down to Argentina in January, like the hottest time of the year. But um, yeah, maybe we'll try to figure out how to swing through Uruguay. Well, if you can take the, the ferry over, you go from Buenos Aires to Montevideo and then Montevideo is like, okay, but I would encourage you to go up to Punta del Este, which Pretty is sad, really, yeah. really beautiful. Uh, or you can take the ferry over to, um, to Colonia, which is a really short ferry, but they only run it at certain times a year. So if you're yeah. there in January, then that'll be high season. So then you should be able to go directly there. It's like an old colonial town and really really stunning and there's lots of cool cafes and restaurants and things awesome yeah that sounds great and, and the, what's the cost uh like the, the prices like there they're see they're kind of you can expect us or or canadian prices maybe a little bit less yeah but not a whole heck of a lot a lot less but uh well like i said it's a first world country you're not this is not central america this is yeah. not argentina where there's five different exchange rates and if you get the blue rate then you know, then you're paying pennies on a dollar, but it, yeah. it's, you know, different type of situations. Right. Right. Cool. What about passports? Like, I know that's your business. Um, where, where do you think is the best place to go? I mean, I told you last time we met that I was working on a St. Lucia passport and I quit. <laughs> like I stopped. Did you really? Yes. Wow, I quit because the, the paperwork was out of control. And I, uh, I, I was, I was, I mean, I was spending a lot of time getting all this paperwork together and then um, the, I got the birth certificate, which all this stuff is a huge pain in the ass because it's like, I mean, they want to know, like I'm divorced, like, oh, I got to get my divorce papers, my marriage papers, my, I mean, it's just goes, it goes on and on and on and on. And I, I got, I got, I got my birth certificate. Um, and I got, they said, oh no, no, that's not the right one. It was like, you need to have your mother's name on the birth. And I'm like, I, I I'm, I'm out. I'm like, I'm not doing this anymore. So yeah. So I may start again. I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> well, I come to me next time. Not that you won't have to provide those things. You yeah. will, but I'll, I'll try to coach you through it and right. get you through it to the finish line a little bit faster and, you know, without pulling your hair out. Yeah. But uh, that's immigration generally in the world. Like they want to know a lot about you and you're going to have to document everything. And there's going to be apostilles for everything. It's a lot of paperwork and people should know that going into these processes. Sure. Um, but it's a pretty serious thing. I mean, especially as a U.S. citizen, if you can get another passport and have another nationality, you can actually look at renouncing your U.S. citizenship, yeah. which for a lot of people is super attractive because U.S. is only one of two countries in the world that taxes uh, both based on residency and citizenship. So right. really, no matter where you live in the world, they're going to come after you for taxation. Right. But if you renounce it and you go through the process correctly, then you have no more filing requirements. You have no more taxes. And if you go through somewhere, St. Lucia or St. Keith's or, you know, these other types of countries in the Caribbean, most of them don't have any tax obligations there. Right. Or you come down to a country that has a territorial tax system like Panama, where I am, or Costa Rica or Nicaragua, which are all countries that we help people get residency in. And then we do a process called naturalization. So after living in the country for a certain amount of years, then you can apply for your citizenship. But that can take five years, seven years, depending on where it is. Yeah. So, but yeah, I, I am a, a big proponent in multiple passports, multiple residencies. But if you 
hate paperwork, then you <laughs> might as well not start. Yeah, that's right. That's right. But you, but you think St. Lucia is one of the best ones and St. Kitts? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 St. Kitts. We love St. Kitts. I mean, I do St. Kitts a lot for people. Uh, for larger families, we do Antigua and Barbuda because it's the most cost effective. Right. But um, the one that I don't do a lot of is Dominica. Uh, we had a bad experience there before. And it's a really small country at the end of the atoll. And yeah. I, I don't do a lot of those ones. But the uh, the other ones, yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. Mm-hmm. And um, you had there was another I, I kind of a switch of topics, but there was a um, you mentioned at one point about you were going to start building a school for like expats and nomads and stuff like that. Is that is that something you're still working on or? Oh, absolutely. So it's called Expat International School. You guys can find out more information at expatschool.io. So. Once again, because I had such a terrible experience with my education, I feel quite passionate about education for kids. And and because I'm such a libertarian, I really hate sending children to an indoctrination camp or a prison <laughs> sentence that we, we call state-run school. So I partnered up with another, uh, another fellow libertarian. His name is Michael Strong. He's been in the education yes. space for 30, I think 33 years, 32 years, something like that. Yep. And I love him. He's amazing. Actually, I was supposed to take a phone call with him today, oh. but ended up rescheduling things so that you and I could have this call. Oh, so, nice. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I talk to him on a weekly basis, so it's not. Oh, a big wow. Deal. Okay. Yeah. No, this is very interesting because I was just reading about some of the things going on in Austin with yep. the schools that they're they're um, that he's a part of. I know it's kind of like Montessori high school type of thing. Correct. So he does a program. He has a domestic school that he runs in the U.S. And I loved his ideas so much that I approached him to see if we could partner together to take his ideas and make them international. Because what happened is as I'm working through all of this with clients to move them offshore and go through the immigration and the taxes and find them a new home country, you know, what kept coming up over and over again is like, well, what do I do with my kids? You know, what about the school? You know, we just got into a good district and blah, 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 blah. So I wanted to find a real solution for these things. Once again, I don't sit around and complain about it all day. I'm trying to find a solution for it. So we started building the school together about two years ago. It's a virtual school and we get a great response. I mean, the kids absolutely love it. They really start to blossom. Like you really see the sparkle come back in their eye. Um, We run three programs. We've got a junior program from eight to 11 and then a middle school from 11 to 14 and then a high school from 14 to 19, but it's all under the same school. So it's just, instead of doing like different grades, we just group the kids together and it's all virtual. So they do zoom calls like, like we're doing today, uh, except there's a guide. So it's all based on Michael's idea of Socratic dialogue. So conversations about ideas instead of like rote memorization, where you just need to memorize facts and figures and what is the longest river and what's the tallest mountain and you know these types of things it's it's conversations about ideas so it's really critical thinking and asking questions and making your point understood and um it's a lot more natural and i i'm a big fan of the work that he does and and the kids love it and it's it's a great thing so that's that's the the school and you guys can find out more information at expatschool.io yeah and that's and that's strictly online right you don't have any actual physical buildings Correct. So one of the other projects that we're doing right now is I'm partnering with a, um, a developer who's building communities throughout Latin America. And we're in talks with him about building a physical school in each one of the communities. Mm-hmm. So what the idea will be is we will pipe in the best teachers in the world and still have a classroom, small, small classrooms, and then have the teacher come in virtually to do special programs, but then have like resource teachers on the ground who can help uh, answer questions or work with the kids or stay organized and things like that. So it's going to be a hybrid type of model. And because all of my people are, you know, they're expats or they're digital nomads or perpetual travelers, they can go between these communities and fall right in, uh, you know, pick up where they left off or as they're traveling, do the program from their laptop. So yeah. it's really going to open up a lot of opportunities for the kids. That's amazing. And, and your kids are doing this or? So my children, so my daughter's six and my son's 18 months. Our programs okay. start at eight. But yes, oh, okay. as soon as my daughter is old enough, she'll be participating in this. Yeah. It's the first program, Kevin, I ever felt comfortable 
about sending my daughter to in my life. And wow. we've looked at many things in the world. Yeah. I didn't like anything that was out there. So we just built something instead. Uh, yeah, that's so cool. And and so like, how many do you, um, do you know, like just kind of the, the statistics or the data on who's involved, who's enrolled in the program now, like where, where do they live and what kinds of, what kind of life do they have? And Yes. Yeah, so I think we're at 140, 145 children or something like that right now. Mm -hmm. We're looking to scale it up from there, but we've got lots of kids uh, here in Central America. So I think that there's five or six or seven families in Panama, I want to say, mm -hmm. a couple in Costa Rica, I think one in Guatemala. Then we have a family in Oman. There's a family in Pakistan. Um and then a bunch in Europe. What we want to do when we get to a critical mass is have three different time zones. So we'll have kind of US central time, then um, standard European time, and then something that would kind of go down Southeast Asia. So any of the families that are living in Thailand or Malaysia or Singapore or these types of places, then, and probably anyone from Australia could kind of fit in that as well. But like, for example, the, the family that is in Pakistan I think the daughter starts school at like 10 o'clock at night or 11 o'clock at night. Wow. And she does it herself. I mean, she sets her own alarm. She has her own schedule and she made the decision to do this because it's something she wants to do so much. Yeah. So there's no forcing her to do this. Right. She loves the program and she wants to be involved. So she makes the sacrifices that come along with that. And that personal responsibility just fits in so well with libertarian value. Oh yeah, that's awesome. I mean, that's a, that, if you're gonna have school, that's how to do it. Is this all in English or? So right now the program is strictly in English. However, we do have uh, secondary languages. So depending on what the child wants to pick up as a second language, we have um, elective programs for that. Uh, in the future, we've also done talks about doing a Spanish language version of the primary things. So being able to do our math program or history or a lot of the conversation in Spanish as well. But that will probably not happen next year, but maybe the year after that. Okay. And, and they get to choose, right? Like it's like you, you, you enroll and then it's like you kind of have choices. It's not like, here's your program for the quarter. Yeah. So there's a lot of elective programs based on what they want. Uh, we are big proponents for advanced reading and mathematics. Mm -hmm. So reading, writing, and spelling and, and uh, mathematics are the things that we really focus on. And then the majority of the other things are electives, but we're super flexible. So it depends on what your child needs and what their goals are. If they want to be an engineer, then you're going to have to have really advanced mathematics. If they want to yeah. be a ballerina, then maybe not. You know, so we work with the families based on their exact wants and needs with all of this. Right. That's very cool. So this is the stuff that I like to hear about because, you know, we were talking about like, how does, how does, how do things get better in the world? And this is it. It's education. I mean, it's parenting and education, right? Those are the two Absolutely. things that are going to change the world. It's not, it's not how much you complain on Twitter or, you know, who you vote for or any of that stuff. It's like, this is, this is the ground zero for it. So I'm, I'm excited about this. I'm definitely going to look into it and, um, yeah, I mean, this is, uh, yeah, this is right down my alley. So thank you. I appreciate that because it's, it's certainly a passion project. Um, I just believe in it so strongly and obviously I want the best for my kids, but I want the best for all the families and then having a viable option for any of my clients and being able to help them because my clients are very freedom orientated as well. Yeah. This really speaks to them and, and these types of values that we share. Yeah. And that's, and that also takes away one of the, um, common like excuses of oh, why I can't do that because I have kids and it's like, where would they go to school? And it's like, yeah, that here it is. Yep. So, exactly. Yeah. yeah very exactly. cool. Yeah. That, that's, that's awesome. Um, yeah. Congrats on, on getting this, you know, really helping to get this thing going. I mean, this is, this is a uh, really, I think it's a, a really impressive to, for you to be involved with this. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. It's not easy um, you know, I've never been a teacher in my life. You sure. know, I'm, I'm not a teacher now. I mean, but trying to understand what it is the kids want and trying to develop the programs and, you know, work with Michael, who's literally, he, he's a genius. I mean, he's, he's absolutely brilliant at what he does. He's so articulate and he's just got a heart the size of the sun. I mean, yeah. he's got so much caring. I, I honestly love the man and, and respect him so much. So to be able to partner with him is just a fantastic experience. Yeah, that's awesome. He's libertarian minded. Very nice. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, very cool. And he has a book, right? There's a, um yeah, he has two. He has uh um basically about Socratic thinking. I can't remember the it's uh the title off the top of my head, but it's from I think it's like from Socratic thought to Socratic ideas. I'm I, I'd have to look it up. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, so you also mentioned you you emailed me just randomly, I think yesterday, about a summit that you're that you're putting on. Correct. Yeah. So November 7th to 11th, we've got an online summit where everybody can grab a free ticket. There's no, no charge to attend. And it really goes into a lot of the things that you and I are talking about today, Kevin. So Michael Strong, he's a presenter at the summit. Uh, I'm doing presentations on second citizenships. So talking about Grenada and St. Keith's and St. Saint, uh, Lucia and all these programs. We're talking about you know different communities in Central America, uh, immigration things, tax planning, all of these things. If you agree that the vehicle for freedom is moving overseas and being an expat and, and traveling the world, um, you know, it doesn't have to be digital nomadism, but, you know, getting outside of Canada and the U S or at least, at least having a plan B backup, then you guys will love this summit. I mean, it's complete, it's totally up your alley. So you guys can find out more information about it at expatsummit.com. Or sorry, expatmoneysummit.com, expatmoneysummit.com. And um, there's a little process. You just click on a big orange button there to get a ticket. They'll come up with three different options. There are paid versions of the ticket for like a whole heap of bonuses. But if you just want to check it out or see if this is for you, then I encourage you to grab a free ticket. You'll be able to watch all the presentations and go through things. And then kind of see for there if, if you like it or not. You know, it's, it's very no pressure. But we've got Dr. Ron Paul as a speaker. My friend Doug Casey is a speaker. Uh, we should be confirming this week Jim Rogers will be a speaker. Um, lots of really big freedom-orientated people. And as well as uh, a lot of people that you would never know their name, actually, Kevin, because it's, it's the lawyers I work with, the accountants mm -hmm. I work with, and you know, the people who are kind of behind the scene, but they're sharing a lot of the information. So you can actually practically go through these things. Very cool. When is that again? So that's November 7th okay. to 11th. And you guys can grab a ticket at expatmoneysummit.com. Awesome. Yeah, I'll definitely check that out. That sounds like a lot of fun. Because I, I, you know, now that I'm, I'm here in Brazil quite a bit, and uh, there's, there's always this thought, though, that's like, you know, they're, they're having this election here, people are getting all tight about what might happen? And is, is, is Brazil going to go full communist or, or what? But, um, but it, you know, it, it's, it, there's always that possibility and, and being able to, like you said, be flexible and be able to, you know, at a moment's notice, be like, okay, not, not staying here anymore. So yeah, this is, this is super helpful stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're happy to take care of your audience and happy to have you come in, uh, check out the summit. I think we've got 37 presentations over five days. So there's a lot of stuff going on, yeah. a lot of extra activities and a lot of networking and get to meet the people. And yeah, it's going to be amazing. I'm super excited. It's six months worth of work. So Wow. Uh, that's yeah, it's, that's it's tough. Putting on events is so hard. I, I can, I can vouch for that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Well, do you want to add anything else? I think we can close it up here, but um, if you want to mention anything else about your, I mean, you've got the summit and you got your business. Yeah, I think this is great. I, lo I love today's conversation and, and happy to help any of your people. If you guys want to find out more information about what I do or, or become a client, you can go to expatmoney.com. Uh, we also have a podcast, which Kevin, you were an excellent guest on my show. We did talk about Brazil. Uh, lots of, lots of interesting things on that one. I think we went for hour and a half, two hours or something. <laughs> Some crazy it's a pretty thing. intense conversation, but yeah. absolutely worthwhile checking out. So if you guys search on your podcasting apps for expatmoneyshow.com, then you'll be able to find us there and then check out Kevin's episode and tons of other really good episodes. I think we've been podcasting for seven years now. So nice going, yeah. on, going on seven years. So yeah, yeah, I highly recommend anyone listening to check out Expat Money Show. Um, it's, you know, like what I like about your show, Mikkel, is, is like you, what you keep talking about is like solutions. Like it's not, it's not a libertarian, like a libertarian with quotes podcast. And that's what I try to do with mine too, is like just sitting around talking about philosophy. There's like thousands of podcasts doing that and they're not moving the freedom ball forward, you exactly. know, and, and I think you're doing your part in moving the freedom ball forward. I love that. And, you know, I'm trying to, trying to add a little bit here as well. And, you know, this is, these are the kinds of things that, 
that it really excite me. So yeah, check it out. And um, you definitely uh, one of the one of the better freedom oriented podcasts, I would say. Thanks. I appreciate that a lot. And I'm a big yeah. fan of your work, Kevin. I think I listened to your show a bunch before we ever got introduced to one another. And then when we got to know each other, became fast friends. So, you know, I'm a big fan of your work. Yeah, thanks. And I'm looking forward to seeing you in Floripa at some point, maybe next year. Definitely, definitely. That'd be amazing. Well, thanks cool. so much, Kevin. I really appreciate it. And, and, and I, hope, uh, I hope your listeners got value out of this today. And, you know, anybody who wants to find out more, then check out the links. So For sure. And we'll have all the links in the show notes. And uh, yeah, thanks again, Mikhail. It's always, always great to talk to you. Perfect. Thanks, Kevin.